Welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake and over SPNN in St. Paul. And a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're delayed in the Stillwater area. And I, I, for those of you that uh, will be watching in the Stillwater area, we're going to talk about the potential merger of the Stillwater and Matamidi School District. Uh, big thing, big meeting happened last night, and it was not uh, um, attended by the press, so the press didn't cover it except for your local cable shows like Inside Insight and Speechless. And um, it was very fascinating information. We're going to show some clips from that. Uh, also, we're going to show clips from the Maplewood City Council meeting. Uh, visitors presentation one John Wyckoff talking about the police um, there's been a big effort going on in Maplewood about making sure uh, restaurants that serve alcohol uh, alcohol um, stores that they liquor stores that they are getting checked to make sure they're not serving liquor to minors as as well they shouldn't be and as well Maplewood should check on that um, but what's happening in this process, um, well, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to see what John Wyckoff has to say, the most famous man in Maplewood, has to say about uh, this process and the hypocrisy that Maplewood is having about publicly reprimanding businesses who serve alcohol to minors, but, children, but when police officers or government officials do it or parents there isn't this public rec reprimand uh, taking place by Kathleen Juneman or anybody else on the city council. So, uh, and then we're going to show a, a CARE 11 piece that will demonstrate the problem that's going on in police departments. And it, it's something for uh, a man like John Wyckoff to get up there and talk because the abuse that comes back for exposing the problem is severe. And Kathleen Juneman, you know, what's too bad is when you, you see John, Mr. Wyckoff, making this presentation, and you see Kathleen, you don't see Kathleen Juneman making all her faces, and then the other, some of the other city council members and the staff making faces, as is to discredit this individual who is actually telling the truth. And, and raising a, a real issue that is taking that is taking place there. Um, before we get into those, and then I'm going to give an update on the uh, Grazzini Rucky case. I had time to talk to uh, Sandra Grazzini Rucky, the mother who's been accused and charged with deprivation of custodial rights of her own kids. In other words, taking her kids um, and and hiding them from the state, basically, because the state said the aunts were to have the, uh, the children. Uh, and not, not from her husband, because her husband didn't have custody then. It was later given to him custody, but then the kids were gone. So this is uh, taking custody away, from, basically, from the state, which at this point in time was other family members. Uh, relatives. Uh, talk to her about the arrest process, what took place, uh, uh, fascinating information, uh, but definitely you're going to want to listen to that because it's just got some insight that's just, you know, how crooked police officers can be. We got great police officers, but when they want to do something wrong, they, do it, they can do it wrong in a big time. And basically the bottom line is Lakeville police officers committed a crime against the federal government by using uh, over the wire, uh, using faxes, using information, giving out false information to get somebody arrested. Okay, so we're going to talk about that <laughs> because this is fascinating what she was arrested for. And uh, Lakeville got caught, but will there be any consequences for getting caught? I do not know uh, if that will take place. So we'll discuss that too. Uh, a couple things first. 
to kind of clear the air. <clears throat> You know, city councils, if they don't want you to show up to things, they change the name of things, make it look like they're not open meetings. But there's an executive session this Monday for Maplewood City Council. It's from 2 to 8 p.m. And it doesn't say whether it's an open meeting or not, uh, where the public's invited. But my understanding is that this is the new wording for a retreat, okay? Then it says, there may or may not be all the council members there, okay? <laughs> so so what is it? And there's no agenda published for this yet that I know of. Uh, there wasn't as of earlier today. So the executive session is the retreat, and this is basically where Maplewood lays out what their goals and objectives are and where the council members try to come to some type of agreement as to what they're going to pursue. And it's also kind of the way of the city staff saying, hey, Maplewood, here's what we want you to do. Here's our concerns. Uh, the city council, here's what we want you to approve. So who's, who's uh, telling each, each other what to do? <laughs> you know, who knows? Um, so wanted to let you know that. Also, I found out on, uh, I'm going to have to look it up on the, there's a next door. Next door is a is a website that uh, you can meet your neighbors, and I had looked. Um, so I registered to that, and you can talk, to, you know, to your neighbors what's going on in the community. And I had gotten a notice from next door. They send out uh, notices, and this one in particular said. Um, Guess what? Chickafill is coming to Maplewood and they're going before the design review board and they're going to open a store. The plan is to open a store where the, the former uh, bar used to be, the dive. So that's just south of Acapulco's in the Maplewood Mall area right on White Bear Avenue. And uh, not, hey, I'm thinking great news. So it's going before the Design re re Review Board, I think, on March 22nd. Okay, And so what this neighbor was saying was people get there to protest that we can't have these bigots, this corporation that's bigots, in, in our town. Okay. You know, and so my reaction is, okay, why are they bigots? Okay, but isn't that bigotry to call somebody out as being bigoted? Yeah, you know, and so, and my understanding is Chickafill is a very well-known uh, Christian-type organization uh, that does a lot of public service and reaching out to the community and very engaged in the community. I mean, who wouldn't want to have that? That type of company that's very engaged in the community around them. Uh, and the other thing is Maplewood just had a workshop on trying to retain businesses, keeping businesses in Maplewood. You know, so here you got some some of the neighbors in Maplewood maybe coming out and saying, we don't want your business. Well, we already got uh, uh, Hobby Lobby, which is very similar to Chickafill as far as corporate governance and corporate beliefs, and there was no protest there, and because everybody knows that's a successful business that's bringing in a lot of money and tax revenue to the city, uh, and Chickafill will probably do the same. But my point is that this lady saying, "Hey, you know, let's be at the design review board to." get rid of this bigoted company that they never come in. Well, she's being a religious bigot. She doesn't understand that our Constitution guarantees the freedom of religion. Our Constitution doesn't guarantee it. Uh, our natural rights from God guarantee that. And so she wants to go against our Constitution, uh, against uh, the laws of nature, to derive this type of freedom that 
that doesn't hurt anybody. That actually helps the community. So that will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, March 22nd, what's today? The 17th? Uh, so I'm thinking this is e either Monday or Tuesday, but you, you're going to have to look on the, I'll eventually bring it up when I get, once I get some videos going. So I think that's uh, very interesting. Uh, also, some <laughs> other things to keep up on. April 8th, 2020, we'll be doing a show on the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case. Um, and that will be at 9 p.m., I believe, is when 2020 shows. It may be at 8, but I think it's 9 p.m. They'll be laying out everything, well, from their angle, their, their story as to the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case. And they've been to town over and over again, probably four or five times, interviewing various people uh, during this time and have put together the story. And they say this time it will air April 8th. There's no postponing it. <laughs> They're going to air it. And of course, this is all before all the court trials uh, come into play. And we're going to talk about some of that in, in a bit. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, let's go to some video here, and I'm going to set this up. John Wyckoff here is talking to the Maplewood City Council, and he is telling them, hey, police officers, you need to be treated fairly, but you have an extra responsibility. So if you have these stores that aren't to serve liquor to minors, you know you're not supposed to do that. And... And then we're going to follow that up with why this is important and show what's not happening to police officers and why there's this culture out there that is hypocritical. So, Nathan, let's uh, play that first video with John Wyckoff there. Avenue East in Maplewood. I have a lot of friends that uh, their children, their sons and daughters work in restaurants and they work very hard to make a living so they can pay their way through school. And I've been up here before to talk about this. I have a very good friend of mine whose uh, son works in a restaurant and he's trying to work his way through school. Um, so one of, his, uh, one of the stories that I heard from uh, a friend of mine that his son was actually uh, made a mistake uh, he was actually uh, fell in the trap from Maplewood here and did not card somebody. The very person that he should have carded uh, didn't card. And so the restaurant is forcing him to pay the big fine, the big penalty, and he needs that money to go through college with. And of course, he's going to have to pay that fine out of his pocket. And so, you know, is this going to take him much longer now to pay his way through school? I'm sure all of you had a, a great way through school. You didn't have these traps and all these things that you had to go through when you were going through school, but now he's going to have to pay for it. And then I only wish that Kathleen Juneman, when she's up here uh, swearing in the police and you guys are bringing in the police, that you would also tell the police that when they make a mistake, and they sell and give uh, liquor to minors that they have to pay double and that they don't get uh, leeway and that they uh, can pay twice and get double the fines when they get caught giving liquor to minors. When are they going to be punished as well when the, when the police give liquor to minors? Don't look at me like that. I've seen it. <coughs> you want me to put out names about that where we've had the police give liquor to minors. I can name names. I know these people. I've, I've been up here talking about it. I know there's very few people tonight that can stand up here and talk about the police doing that, but they never get recommended. I never hear Kathleen Juneman talk about these people. Oh no, she would never do that. But I would think that when the police get sworn in, that maybe they should be warned that when they get caught, that maybe they should be uh, fined, maybe they shouldn't be uh, sent home with pay when they get caught. I don't think that that's fair, do you? But yet when these students are going to school and they're trying to make their way through college and school and that they're paying, they're paying fines, big huge fines, I think the police should pay fines as well. Don't you guys agree? All you people agree? 
I think the police should pay fines. I do. Maybe they should even go to jail. Maybe the police should pay twice the fine, don't you? Hey, Brian, what do you think? I think they should go to jail. Thank you. All right. <laughs> very, very good uh, questions. And first of all, I mean, you have to card. You got to make sure who you're serving this stuff to. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, is it a form of entrapment? Yeah. Well, who knows? But the intent in what you're hearing is these people, Maplewood's coming in. These bartenders don't know who these people are, okay, or, or employees. And Maplewood's coming in in very busy, busy times and under suspect situation so they'll try to make the lighting or actually you can't even see the uh, ID uh, they won't give it to you so they, they show you that they altered the ID or whatever but is that really an issue um, the big thing here is the hypocrisy that's going on Maplewood is going to make a public example of people there was like four companies there businesses that were getting two thousand dollar fines so this is a third third time, third or fourth time that they've been caught serving um, alcohol to minors. But what's happened when the police officers in Maplewood are serving alcohol to minors, the Maplewood City Council doesn't talk about it. They, I, don't, I don't remember them talking about uh, when Kevin Coffey took city pages to write a big article on him, how he was chasing a run girl, sexually harassing her, underage girl and giving her liquor okay and then Joseph Tran who was giving underage uh, liquor to uh, minors yeah in, in Stillwater so <clears throat> there was no public outcry so John's request to the police officers about serving liquor to minors I, I think that's well warranted that's a very very good point you know and there isn't this public reprimand when it happens. And there isn't this marching these people in front of the city council and saying, you did this and you can't do this. And, you know, it should be the same, but it's not. And why? I don't know. I don't know why it's not. I, except for the aspect that there's an image that needs to be kept. So in my opinion, there was an effect, but I don't know. I think that's why Chief Tamala resigned, retired at age 51 or whatever, how old, I don't think it was much older than that, if he was, <clears throat> and making more income than when he uh, was actually being employed by Maplewood because of his retirement pension. So, I mean, that could be a factor, but was he forced out because of these incidents with police serving alcohol to minors? But still, there was no bringing the police officer in, okay, we're going to fine you $2,000, and should that fine be bigger? You know, so uh, John's point on the hypocrisy is really big. Now, I'm going to show you a video. Carol Evan did an investigation, which I think is fascinating. It will give you an idea as to why and how um, this may not be disclosed. So let's see what this has to say. Tonight, CARE 11 investigates a routine DWI arrest that took a strange twist. The suspected drunken driver was allowed to go free. CARE 11's A.J. Legault reports. A late night alarm call leads Blaine police officers to a store parking lot where they spot a running car. You've got to be kidding me. The driver apparently passed out. There we go, I got him. When he does wake up... Hey, police, you mind opening the door for me? He seems incapable of following what? basic instructions. Keep opening it. Okay, open the door. Oh, great, it pisses out of this camp. Why don't you zip up for me? Instead of complying, the driver slams on the gas. What are you doing? Open your door. Thankfully, the car was not in gear, and eventually the man behind the wheel gets out. I want to do some tests to make sure you're going to be able to drive. 
sobriety tests get off to a rocky start. Again, basic requests seem not to be understood. Take off your hat. No, I want you to take off your hat. I don't know what you want me to do. I want you to take off your hat. Very he couldn't walk a straight line, and eventually the officers give up. Why don't you just go sit on my bumper, okay? Sure. You're going to fall over on me. Yep. Out comes the breathalyzer. Oh, blow, 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 blow. There you go. Keep Officers going. would Keep later going. claim Keep he blew going. a point two zero two, more than two and a half times the legal limit. Well, William, right now I'm going to place you under arrest for DWI. Okay, so put your hands behind your back for me. Cuffed okay. and under arrest, the man is put in the back of the patrol car. It all seems pretty standard. A textbook DWI bust until the cops examine the man's wallet. Listen carefully. Oh, crap. Watch what happens here. Without another word, both officers pull out and turn off their body mics. Them off for me. Yes, sir. The only microphone now working is the one in the patrol car. The man under arrest is let out. Fast forward a few minutes, and when he gets back in, the handcuffs are off. Just stay warm, okay? Thanks. And instead of going to jail, I just need to figure out a way to get it in the home. A ride home is arranged. I need to find somebody that can come and pick you up. Okay. Uh, anybody? Well, preferably one of your buddies. Turns out the man previously uh, under arrest for DWI and now getting that? special treatment is not your ordinary citizen. William Momberg is a Columbia Heights police officer. I appreciate you guys working with us. And the cover-up is on. It's what's known in police circles as professional courtesy. The notion that cops don't ticket other cops. I don't condone their behavior. I mean, I wish they'd made a different decision. But cops are human. Dwayne Wolf is a retired officer. DWI. And current law enforcement instructor at Alexandria Technical and Community College. This is a contentious subject. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> Wolf says there can be a lot of peer pressure. Like I said, a lot of police officers feel that pressure to take care of their brethren. It's a sentiment you can find expressed on a lot of police blogs. Wolf, who is also a columnist for PoliceOne.com, has written about so-called professional courtesy. Well, the article is the most commented article I've ever written. In it, he makes the argument against the badge being a get-out-of-jail-free card. That doesn't serve the profession, it doesn't serve the department, and quite honestly, it doesn't serve the officer. They just get the attitude that there are no consequences for my actions. Back to Blaine, where Officer Monberg, along with his get-out-of-jail-free card, wants to make sure there's nothing about his situation entered into the computer. You know, it's in the uh, CAD notes. Um uh, nothing. Okay. On this night, no arrest, no reports, no mug shots, and dawn breaks with just a free pass because he wears a badge. Let me go hop on your pass in your seat. Sure. Blaine Police Chief Chris Olson is apparently not a believer in special breaks for police officers. When he found out what happened, he put an investigator on the case. And about a, about a month after he was let go with no arrest, Officer Momberg was charged with DWI. The case is still pending, so Chief Olson would not discuss it on camera, but told us, quote, in this case, inexperienced officers made a mistake. It's not acceptable. My expectation is fair and impartial policing, and that didn't happen. We need to treat people fairly, and it shouldn't matter what they do for a living. Meantime, Officer Momberg pleaded not guilty to DWI. He has a court date later this week. Today he sent me a statement saying, quote, I'm profoundly ashamed, embarrassed, and disappointed in myself for that incident. He also goes on to apologize to his department, community, and the Blaine officers that he says he put in a tough spot. Now you can read the entire statement on our website at carolevin.com. And AJ, if you can share how, how we found out about this whole situation. Uh, I found out uh, doing background on another story we were working on. I was looking into officers who were on the scene and came across this case, so asked for the video, and uh, you saw what we found when we got it. All right. I think citizens would be uh, very upset if they saw that as a routine by police officers.
Yeah, it's definitely uh, drawing a lot of uh, debate even on yeah. the station Facebook and my AJ Investigates Facebook page tonight, uh, folks weighing in uh, on both sides of the issue. Especially how serious drunk driving is. Oh, yeah. so. mm -hmm. Thank you, AJ. Wow. <laughs> That's just amazing. Um, I, I think it's interesting to note that the police officers there turned off their body, mi body mics. Uh, and that they covered this up, that if this reporter hadn't been looking at something else that was going on uh, and found it, nobody would have known about this. I do want to comment that the police officer did apologize to the community, make a public apology. I don't know if he went before the city council and did that, and I don't necessarily believe he should lose his job either because of that but he should be fined he should be charged uh, in the process and like anybody else okay but like John Wyckoff said maybe there should be a higher uh, penalty because I mean they do know better they uh, they they teach about this and and I hope the man's getting help. Um, and I, but you got there's this words that were say said by the superiors, inexperienced officers. I don't buy that for a second. These officers, in my opinion, were trained to behave that way. You don't just all of a sudden turn off the mics in unison. You know. I mean, that's trained, that's planned ahead. You don't all of a sudden don't enter anything into the CAD reports. You don't all of a sudden take the guy home. You know, that's planned. That's not inexperienced officers, that's experienced officers. And the, the guy pled not guilty. And you know what? That's what everybody should do when you're charged with crime, plead not guilty. Okay, let the process work out. So I don't, I definitely don't blame the guy for that. Uh, but somewhere down the line, he's going to have to plead guilty to something here. But the cover up, the cover up on this, unbelievable. What happened to these other officers who covered this up? And you all know the cover up's worse than the crime. That's, that's what happens. We're not, what's, what's going on with these other officers? And as John Wyckoff raises the question, should there be jail time for this, for the cover-up? All right, we got a caller. Caller, do you have a comment or question? I have, I have a comment. Okay, thanks. The example that you showed with, in the CARE TV relates to the issue about body cameras. Yes, it does. You, you have to remember that this incident was not found out. Uh, until uh, AJ got a tip, right, and he searched out, couldn't see the records, but he found there was a dash cam. Now, let's talk about this with body cameras now. Uh huh. The is the issue, what you saw, it's not just with cops. Maybe it could be a senator, a mayor, right? You know, uh, someone that's not part of the regular folks, and right. that was the essence of the story. Yes. But how are you going to find that out when you have dash cam video, which has been generally public for 15 years? And for another example, Maplewood and Burnsville are getting rid of dash cams uh -huh. because they have body cameras. Mm -hmm. So now, how about if this happened with a body camera? <clears throat> we would never, never know about it because of the bills that are going through the legislature make any kind of thing that what happens in the public and when it's done by body cam videos secret the right. lats bill the cornish bill there's an initiative by peggy scott that says that it's public again with you know all the privacy if you're victim of crime sex crime stuff like that that would still be private uh -huh. but i'm just trying to share with you uh, how it's important that how this was found out was by a camera, right. dash cams, cameras, but now law enforcement is going towards body cams. And for me, 
I'm so, well, you know, you already know Mr. Kenley, who you may this know this is. Oh Rich yeah, Rich Neumeister. Neumeister. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, I'm on top of all these issues, and this is what's happening yeah. down at the legislature right now. So what you're saying is there's an effort because we got body cameras. Let's get rid of the dash cams. Well, what's what's happening is the new technology. It's new new hardware, huh. you know. And so with some police departments, they're saying. Why should we have both of them? Right. So Burnsville and Maplewood have decided to either they've gotten rid of them or they're starting to get rid of them. Okay. And it's because they have body cameras. Okay. And this, and, but see, what happens here is that body cameras, there's a legislation going through to make a, not a lot of that available to the public. The only reason why dash cams is public was because 15 years ago there was a big issue about driving while black. Uh huh. Right. As you may remember. Oh, and it's still and an issue. <laughs> Stanick, who at that time was a legislator, mm -hmm. uh, didn't want to do all the details and all that sort of stuff. And what happened was body cams or wow. dash cams. Okay. And so the thing is now, uh, you know, all I'm saying is technology and all that, and that if by, the bottom line is. If the bills go through at the legislature, as they are now with Lance and Cornish, you'll never see, again, the kind of stuff that you're seeing now. There's going to be less transparency, less accountability about and the behavior that cops do. Yeah. Very, very true. Uh, Got to make sure the dash cam stay, that's for sure. Yeah. And, very and, good. and the body cam video yep. should be public in the public right. area. When it's filmed, right, uh, with with current data privacy protections for sure. crime victims and things like that. Yep, absolutely. All right, thank you. Yep, I agree with you. See, Rich Newmeister is a guy who calls in. He's very active in in uh, public data issues down at the Capitol, and we disagree on a lot of other issues. We agree on this one. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I will talk to the Maplewood City Council about this issue. And you need to also, and your city council, don't get rid of dash cams. Uh, that's already all public anyway. So, I mean, you're, you're in the rest, you're in the car, the officer's doing his duty. Keep it going. All right, we got to go to the next video. We're quickly running out of time. This is me talking to the Maplewood City Council uh, uh, about the Maplewood Community Center. And so we're going to watch it. I'll come back with my comments and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, I noticed on your communications that you still call this PEG uh, service for the uh, local cable. Uh, so I want to know, you can tell me after the meeting where I give my cable show speech list Thursday night at 8 p.m. Where I, who I give it to so you can play it on the PEG service, uh, the public side. Uh, also, I'd like to see a link on the city council meeting page to the live or archive meetings. There's no link when you, there where is. you have the minutes and stuff. There is? Yes. There okay, be. I can't find it. So, <laughs> someone can show me where it is. I was looking for it all over the place. It's on the website, but not on the city council meeting page. Um, I was surprised at the reaction to uh, my recommendation to sell the community center, and especially some of the uh, reasons why not to. It's busy. Uh, no, uh, you're not making money. And if you want to attract businesses and have business retention in Maplewood, I would set an example as doing good business yourselves. And losing money for 20 years is not good business. Why would they listen to you? Uh, because you have no example of good business, especially now with the takeover of the cable where uh, you're collecting more money and we're getting less service uh, and less information and less channels. Uh, also, in the ambulance fund being uh, in debt every year. Uh, you just don't have the business stuff and part of being, just be a good example. So busy doesn't do it if it's not making it. Every business that's busy goes under. Now I want to make a connection to uh, North Heights Lutheran Church. Of course I say you're not a church. Maplewood Community Center is not a church. You have the force of taking people's property uh, through taxation to make things go. 
you know, North Lights Lutheran Church had to close its doors because it couldn't make it. Worked for years and years and years, but this year didn't work, had to close its doors for a variety of reasons. Some very similar to what's going on here. Uh, but first year, didn't work, closed doors. I think you should set a good business example, a good model, and uh, what uh, the free people of the United States have to do, and, and you're forcing them and to be reckless in your own spending. Um, studies. We, we don't need to do studies. We already know North St. Paul closed, uh, community center closed its doors because it uh, couldn't fund. We already know Arden Hills is in deficit spending, and you already know your own facility. So why do you need to do a study and take that time and energy uh, to justify having a community center losing money? That's the only purpose. See, everybody else is losing money, so we can too. Doesn't work that way. Thank you, Mr. Kinley. Thank you. John White. All right. My, my point on the PEG service, okay, P-E-G, Public Education and Government. So Maplewood is still going around saying, we got public TV here, okay? They don't. They just have government TV. Matter of fact, uh, because citizens were complaining, uh, they didn't have the education stuff going. I think it's starting to go now, but they didn't have that. And, uh, but here, their intent is not to have the public side. So don't call it PEG, call it EGG, <laughs> you know, uh, service. So don't, don't scam the people. Don't pretend something's happening that's not happening. And, and you better lower your rates uh, because you're, you're, you're not giving the people what you say you're giving them. So it's, it's fraud, okay? You're, Maplewood City Council, you're committing fraud. Now, I had mentioned live or archived meetings. And I went, now I look at their website today, and Nathan, if you can pull that up here, um, I, I had mentioned live meetings. You can, you can watch the Maplewood City Council live. A lot of city councils, you can watch the meeting live, and you can watch them archived. But the thing is, um, are we not? Uh, what do you need? Uh, I need this computer here. Okay. Yeah. The Maplewood City Council website, when I was going through there looking, there was not a link to watching live or archive meetings. It wasn't there. Okay, and so uh, we're going to wait till the page gets up there so I can show that to you. And I got an email back from one of the city uh, employees who was watching and said, here's, here's the link. I'll show you the link here. And what he shows me is right down here. View archive meeting packets and minutes. Okay, well, yeah, those are archive meetings packets and minutes, but I was talking about the live show and the archive shows. Well, now Maplewood has a link here watch archive meetings anytime. Now I'll click on that, and you can also watch the live show too. So they should have put watch live and archive meetings. Okay. I don't know why they didn't do that, but at least the link is up there now. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't, I've looked all over that. The link was a somewhere else on the web, uh, somewhere else in the Maplewood City Council, not City Council, but the Maplewood website. But now that is there now. Now, if you follow this link to archive meeting and packets, which I was shown as the, where the link was, <clears throat> this is what you get. You get a whole different page and nowhere on this page does it link to the live meetings or their archive meetings. So just want to show you that distinction there but the good news is uh, they have the, the, the link now here to watch archive meetings. But if you're looking and you know the Maplewood City Council is meeting and you want to watch the live you could look at that and go okay that's giving me archives where do I go for the live? You know, communication, and they want to take over the cable shows <laughs> for the city. Um, the whole issue, you know, this business stuff. Uh, I, you know, I, I had a poor close in that. 
And there was a great opportunity for me to say, close the doors, sell the place, put it under new management, get rid of it. You're not doing a good job, and you haven't. And I didn't say that. I didn't put in that, close the doors. <laughs> you know? uh, so I wanted to say that now. Um, close the doors. And be an example, you know. R run your city like a business for the business things you're running the city with the ambulance fund, the cable TV, and the uh, Maplewood Community Center. Okay. All right. There was a meeting. Boy, we're running out of time quick. So, Nathan, the video we're going to show is the last video there, uh, not the first two. Uh, Stillwater, the board of Minnesota Board of Education had a required meeting because 50 residents requested that there be a meeting uh, for a potential merger of the Stillwater and Mata, uh, Mata School District. My big thing, and, and we're not going to see this, but Shannon Bryant put together a wonderful presentation as to why these meetings, these school districts should be merged. And we videotaped that. We're going to get that up on the website, um, on, on the uh, Speechless YouTube website. And, uh, and it's going to play uh, over public access TV in Stillwater and over here at SCC also. Uh, it was a fantastic meeting. The press didn't show up except for local cable TV, Speechless and Inside Insight. So that's how you're going to get it. I believe that the Board of Education was astounded at what they were hearing. I believe the Board of Education got an education of how these school districts are behaving very poorly. What the Board of Education did that night was something that the people of Stillwater and Maplewood, <laughs> I throw in Maplewood, City of Grant, Matamidi School District don't get, and that's respect. Board of Education gave us respect. They listened, they were polite, they let people run over a little bit of time uh, because they knew it didn't matter. Let, let's hear what you got to say. And so it was a very good meeting that way. And uh, so we're going to, uh, I forget this lady's name, we're going to hear it, uh, Kesserly. Uh, she had a great speech, but she was kind of summarizing. And everybody, because um, Bryant's, mess, Mrs. Bryant's message was so well, we really were just summarizing her message. <laughs> so let's watch this video. Thank you. I uh, have a sick child. I wasn't planning on being here tonight, so I don't have prepared comments. I'm just going to speak off the top of my head, but I felt it was important to be here this evening. Um, Ma'am, could you please uh, state your name spelled for the record? Absolutely. Julie Casserly, C-A-S-S-E-R-L-Y. And I live in the Stillwater District. And, you know, we're here today to talk about a consolidation, essentially a merger. And before you are really able to consider a merger, you have to consider the health and the status of the two parties involved. And in particular, I want to talk for just a few moments about the health and the status of the Stillwater District, which is something I happen to know something about. Um, in particular, I want to talk about the Minnesota Department of Education and its involvement in uh, determining the health and status of the Stillwater District. As you know, prior to the bond referendum, the Minnesota Department of Education was required statutorily to engage in what's called a review and uh, comment procedure for the people in the audience. That means that the Stillwater District was required to present to the Department of Education a fairly extensive listing of um, information regarding the projects that it wanted to pursue in the referendum, including capacity analysis and a number of other things that are set forth in the law. And you received this document right here um, and reviewed it. And let me say that the Stillwater District was not humble in its description of its efforts uh, in researching the necessity of these projects, which included the construction of a new elementary school, uh, expansion of the high school, a bus garage, and roughly $7 million for our AstroTurf and a new concession stand at the high school football stadium. 
And Stillwater insisted quite clearly that it needed more capacity in this district. It didn't qualify it. It didn't say we need more capacity in the south, but we have too much in the north. It just blankly told you that it needed more capacity. And nowhere in this proposal did it tell you, Dr. Caselius, that it had any intention of closing any schools. Uh, in fact, quite to the contrary, it stated in here that it needed to make particular upgrades to all the elementary schools, including the three that are now slated for closure. And as part of its support for this document, it provided you significant documentation, including the Long Range Facility Committee Planning Report, a demographic study by Hazel Reinhardt, and other documentation. Then it got permission from you to uh, proceed with the referendum. The referendum passed, narrowly but it passed. And then lo and behold, a few months later, there's a new superintendent, which we all knew would happen as the uh, previous superintendent was always a, uh, you know, a limited duration. And the new superintendent says, oh my gosh, I had an aha moment. We don't, or we have excess capacity, and now we need to close about a quarter of our elementary schools. Well, what's the basis for this aha moment? The exact same documents that the Stillwater District provided to you, doctor, in support of their referendum where they said, we need more capacity, we need to build a new elementary school. And I have a very big problem with this, and it's not just the logical inconsistency. The Department of Education and the review and comment procedures are very important. They serve to protect the taxpayers of the state, and they, they serve to ensure that school districts are not going to go off on frolics and follies and build unnecessary projects. And you should have the right to rely on the information and the documentation provided to you. And the people providing that documentation and information need to know what they're doing and they need to take it seriously and they have to be willing to stand behind it. Otherwise, the process falls apart and the public cannot rely on assertions being made in support of a referendum. Why should someone vote for a referendum if they can't rely on the documentation and the information and they can't rely on your scrutiny? In this case, there's no new information. There was no change. You were told, we need more capacity. We need to spend $26 million to build a new elementary school. And then to suddenly turn around and say, we have too much capacity. We need to close three elementary schools is disingenuous at best. And it makes the Department of Education's review process look futile, toothless, or inept. And that's wrong. Just two weeks ago, I stood here in this very spot at the hearing for the bold proposal. And I said in my speech, have fun explaining this to Dr. Caselius. And I meant it because they owe you an explanation. They owe you a detailed and very good explanation as to how it is that you take one position and then turn around a few months later when nothing has changed and take the opposite position. And I hope, Doctor, that you will force them to give you that explanation because frankly, they have been unwilling to provide the citizens of this community any explanation whatsoever. Thank you. Now, what I, very good. And, and the point was well made. The Board of Education, you've been lied to. But what was made before all of that was telling the Board of Education that the citizen has been lied to by the uh, school districts. So the school districts are lying to whoever they can lie to, you know, to get their way. And the big issue for Matamidi was building a school on a toxic waste dump and hiding that and not disclosing it not only to the residents of Matamidi, city of Matamidi, the school is in the city of Grant. Uh, <clears throat> so we're not telling people what's going on. We're deceiving people in order to get our way. You know, why do you have to do that? So the only reason you really have to lie is to underhandedly benefit people that you don't want people to know are being benefited. Uh, that's what I see. Well, what's come out of this, uh, at least the Stillwater levy problem, uh, where they changed their goals and their levy, is uh, a lawsuit by Melissa Douglas that was filed in court, is a writ of mandamus, uh, verified petition for a preemptory writ of mandamus. And they're 
basically saying, hey, judge, order the school district to stop what they're doing and do it right. Okay, and here are the issues, the four issues. Since the school district has committed a public wrong by failing to adhere to a statutory duty to bring the issue of a change of purpose, of a change purpose of obligation proceeds to the electors for approval, a writ may be issued. A change of, this is very specific wording here, to bring the issue of a change purpose of obligation proceeds to the electors for approval. In other words, they passed the levy for one reason, now they're changing the purpose of the levy and they have an obligation to the, citizen, to the citizens to let them know of that change, to let the citizens re-vote, okay? Because the money was to upgrade technology and upgrade these schools in Stillwater area and now they're closing these schools down to build one school. Uh, in my understanding. Now, the interpretation of Minnesota Statute 475, this is the second reason, so Minnesota Statute 475.58 is unambiguous, requiring the school district to provide Stillwater electors the opportunity to change or expand the purpose for which the proceeds of approved obligations were originally designated by ballot. So it's, it's the... Uh, residents, it's the citizens that get to decide what the change is going to be, if there's going to be a change. Third issue, the school district cannot materially deprive, uh, deviate from the original purpose of using the obligations issued after the approval of the voters. Closing of three existing elementary schools is a monumental shift from the original purpose of improving schools for the health and safety of children. The fourth issue, the school district created a social contract with the voters and a trust for the voters through its own processes and procedures regarding the bond referendum and the purpose of the obligation proceeds. All right, big lawsuit, uh, writ of mandamus. We're going to keep you up to date on that to see what's going to happen. And that's why the shenanigans, shenanigans of Matamidi and Stillwater School Board. Uh, that's why they're asking for a merger and to, a cleaning of the house. Uh, it may not happen till the next election, but uh, this, is, this is bad. This is bad governance. This governance gone wild. Okay, we got a quick update on the Sandra Grazzini case. I talked to her uh, for a while. What she was telling me, and I have the, the um, Osceola County Jail uh, primary assessment here in, in my hands. And <clears throat> what she was telling me is the city of Lakeville contacted the U.S. We got a phone call? All right, let's make this quick. Call or comment or question. You got about 15 seconds. First of all, the, the Montemite School District's administrative costs are $2 million. The Stillwater administrative costs are four million that it's really about the establishment it's never about the kids building the school that new school down in uh, elementary school in woodbury is just about keeping the people from woodbury ever getting out of the district of stillwater because the people down there want to be part of the woodbury district it's it's never about the kids and right by the voters having approved that referendum, it allowed the district to have more uh, classroom space, which allowed them to be able to close those three schools. Right. People in St. Paul, they're uh, building a new school in the north, St. Paul is building a new school in the northeast corner of St. Paul. Right. They expect to pull in open enrollment from Maplewood. It, it yep. just stinks what these people it are just, doing. It go, keeps going. Uh, All right, we you, got, I got to go. I got to get this information out. But, you know, watch Bob Zick's show, Inside Insight. We're going to have the more of the videos ready and, and a deeper analysis of what's going on than what I'm providing here. But this open enrollment and this game, should, I mean, it's a game being played. And you know who's benefiting? Not the kids. It's the building contractors. That's who's putting these people on the school board. All right. She was classified 
The city of Lakeville called the U.S. Marshals to arrest Sandra. They figured out she was in Florida. She, they said, told the U.S. Marshals, according to Sandra, that she was gun running, she was in possession of a gun, and of course, uh, they said she had a carry permit, but she doesn't. Uh, and they charged her, they said she was charged with kidnapping and trafficking of children. Um, but what Minnesota wouldn't do is send a warrant to the U.S. Marshals because the U.S. Marshals says, okay, we'll pick her up, uh, send us the warrant, and they wouldn't send it to her, <laughs> send it to them. Uh, so then they, they, uh, the, the U.S. Marshal says, hey, you know, they got her and said, but hey, look here, the, the, your paperwork's not adding up. We got to release her. And Lakeville said, hey, uh, send her to the Osceola County. You know, give her to the county. Make this a state issue rather than a federal issue. And so she was sent to Osceola County where there's an extradition signed by Governor Dayton. Osceola County and then Sandra, you know, heard of the extraditions, was told. She signed off on it. Uh, then instead of flying her back to Minnesota, they took the long route, nine days to get her back. Went through Texas, up to Michigan, Wisconsin, and over, driving an event. They don't normally do that. Okay, 2020, April 8th. The show will have that Sandra Grazzini case. We're out of time. Thanks for watching. God bless. Um, hopefully we'll see you next week. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Sets on fire.